Welcome. We're going to be talking about accessible web design. I'm going to offer you seven basic tips for making your websites more accessible. You can get a copy of these slides at go.uvm.edu slash accessibility. Now, in addition to seven basic tips for avoiding the most common web accessibility issues, we're going to go through accessibility, just a few basic ideas and some legal ideas that have most relevance here in the United States. So basically, everything that makes for good graphic design makes for good web design. We released an earlier video on accessible graphic design talking about fonts and readability and legibility, and you can get the slides and video for that at go.uvm.edu slash accessibility. As always, inaccessible design equals bad design. If folks are unable to access the content, the information on your site because of the design, your design is not doing its job. Now, I get asked a lot for accessible templates, accessible presentation templates, accessible Word documents, and we can provide accessible templates all day long. But as soon as people start interacting with an accessible template, they're making design choices. And we know from a 2017 study that 67% of accessibility failures come down to design choices. Accessible web design is everyone's job, whether you are updating a Drupal website here at the University of Vermont, or you're creating a WordPress site, or you're leaving comments on Reddit, you're creating YouTube videos or, or TikTok videos, it's everyone's job. But who decides what is accessible? Enter the WCAG. So the Web Accessibility Initiative is an, a group that produced an international set of standards, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which are currently on uh, version 2.1. 2.2 is expected any day. But the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines are a set of international standards that many countries use as simply law for how websites should be accessible. I'm thinking of uh, at least New Zealand, Hong Kong, India, and then other countries use the WCAG guidelines as sort of the basis for creating laws related to accessibility. So it might not be the whole set of guidelines, but they develop a, a, a set of laws based on those guidelines. And it's France, Portugal, Japan, off the top of my head. Um, but in the United States, accessibility is only enforced by lawsuit, which means no one can stop you from creating inaccessible websites unless they decide to sue you and then it gets decided in the courts. But in the United States, public and government entities are required to meet WCAG's AA level. Uh, so University of Vermont and the Center on Disability and Community Inclusion are public and government entities. We're covered by that. So what is the AA level? So according to the WCAG guidelines, A level, single A level, means basic website functionality. If something falls outside of the A level, if you are not meeting A level accessibility, your website is broken. It does not work for many people. It is the A level guidelines are fundamental for a website to work. Double A level guidelines are what makes a reasonable website function. And triple A level is when you want to go to gold standard website functionality. Let me give you an example. Let's talk about videos. Videos are super popular on websites. If your video doesn't have captions or a transcript, it's not meeting A level basic website functionality. You're only offering the information as a video that people need to be able to hear to get the information from. That means your website is broken in this capacity. Double A level, reasonable website functionality says that you have captions and that you've gone through them and, and made sure that, that they make sense. There's a little bit of a gray area around automated versus not automated captions, which we'll get into. But as a guideline for you, double A level, reasonable website functionality involves captions that you verified actually make sense. And then triple A level for this video example would be where you're including, for example, a audio description track. So this is a track that talks about what is happening on screen if you're not able to view the screen. And that would be in addition to providing uh, captions and or a transcript. Let's get into our seven basic tips. Number one is images. 
don't assume everyone can see images. People might be browsing with their images off because they're trying to save bandwidth. They're in an area of low bandwidth. People might be using a text-only browser. Some people are blind or low vision and can't see images. Don't include text in an image unless it's available elsewhere on the page as plain text. You, you get this a lot with phone numbers on the contact areas uh, of websites where they turn out to be images. And you can't copy and paste a text in an image. That's actually a great way to test whether an image is text or uh, an actual image. Can you, can you highlight the text with your cursor? If you can't, it's likely to be an image or some other type of, of inaccessible to, for copy and pasting purposes. And it's just not going to show up for a lot of people who are browsing without images unless you're using alt text. So you can capture the text, a lot of the text in your image as alt text. Um, and if you're not gonna use alt text, you might wanna mark the image as decorative. Let's talk a little bit more about this alt text business. Alt text should be one to three sentences long, and it should focus on the most important elements of the image. If you are writing the alt text for a photo of a group of people sitting in a, in a parlor smiling for the camera, you may not want to get into the design on the wallpaper. You don't need to include that level of detail in your alt text unless it's relevant for the context of the image. If they're all pointing to the wallpaper, then you're probably going to add that, that design as a, a part of your alt text. But otherwise, you want to focus on the most important elements of the image. You also don't want to start off your alt text with the words a photo of or an image of because that's how screen readers announce to users that they've encountered an image. Your screen reader will actually say a photo of or an image of. So if you are writing in the alt text a photo of, screen reader users are going to hear a photo of, a photo of, and then what's happening in the photo. It's going to get really old really fast. Let's talk about some alt text exercise. Now, on the right side of the screen, I have a photo that I would like for you to imagine that, how would you describe this image to someone on a phone call? Imagine you stumbled upon this scene in your day and you wanted to call your best friend and tell them about it. What would you say to them? The alt text I've chosen here is a group of people in their mid twenties sit around a picnic blanket in a forest grinning while their small white dog wanders off. I think that captures the main concept of the image. Um, when I've done this exercise with groups of folks uh, live, some people have, have wanted to mention they all have red plastic cups or many of them are wearing sunglasses. I want to talk about the weather. It seems like it's a pretty nice day. They're all in short sleeves. That all works. Uh, there's no one There's no one who's going to come around and tell you your alt text is wrong unless it's a user who is trying to get information on your web website. So you're going to do your best to describe the most important elements of any photo in your alt text. Tip number two, color and contrast. Don't assume everyone can see all colors. Don't assume everyone sees color the same. Don't use color to indicate meaning. This means you don't want to put something on your website that says something like, to sign up for trainings, click the purple trainings button. For general questions, click the red button. You are just, yeah, that made sense. <laughs> so instead you want to say something like, to sign up for the trainings, click the trainings button. Or for general questions, click the contact button. Contrast wise, you, WCAG has you covered. For to meet double A level guidelines, small and large text should have a 4.5 to 1 contrast ratio, and your icons and graphics should have a 3 to 1 contrast ratio. But how on earth are you going to determine whether you're meeting the, the contrast ratio? Meet the Web Aim Contrast Checker. The Web Aim Contrast Checker is a website that is actually mentioned in the WCAG guidelines. It's the industry standard for uh, co checking contrast, checking color contrast. You can find other col color contrast checkers out there, but this is my favorite. 
You can do something like with Firefox, take an eyedropper and sample the colors of your text and your background and drop them into the boxes in the contrast checker, your foreground color and your background color. You hit enter and it automatically calculates your contrast ratio and it tells you whether you're meeting or failing WCAG AA and AAA standards. Tip number three, audio and video. If you have content available, available as audio or video, you also need a text version. Podcasters, I'm talking to you. You cannot have audio or video be the only way for visitors to access that information. So let's break this down by media. All audio needs a transcript. Podcasters, again, talking to you. All your podcasts need a transcript in order to be accessible. Sure. It's not against the law in the United States to ha have a podcast that doesn't have a transcript, but you legitimately can get sued for that because it does not meet WCAG guidelines. Video needs non-automated captions. That's, uh, there is some, there is some wiggle room there around automated versus non-automated captions. Again, this comes down to who's going to take the time to sue you, but think about it this way. I believe right now, Automated captions, are we generally assume they're 60% accurate. That means that for every 10 words, they're going to mess up four of them. That's almost half of the words they're not getting correct. So if you think about wanting to hear or read text and you're only able to read or hear six out of every 10 words, that's going to be really hard if, that, if you're depending on that text. So... Non-automated captions are really the way to go. Take a minute to go back through your content and clean them up and make sure that it makes sense. And again, if you want to go to that triple A level for websites, you would provide something like audio description for videos. If you have a video that tells a very visual story, you might want to include an audio description track. This could be something like a campus tour where you know, you're going to be moving through a lot of different scenery, a lot of different locations. And you might want to have some sort of description of those locations as they occur. So say, for instance, you were flying a drone through the Davis Center on campus, something we would never actually do. But if you were, then you, know, you would potentially have an audio description track that said something like, a high ceilinged marble floored atrium is filled with chairs, and tables and students milling about. Tables are set up for campus representatives to talk with students. Moving down the hallway, past an information desk staffed with a smiling woman. Past the fireplace, there's the radio station with glass doors. A DJ sits in the booth talking into a microphone. So you can imagine pursuing this drone through the Davis Center and actually getting a very good idea of what is being displayed. That would be your gold standard audio description track. Tip number four. This is a big one. Links. Let's talk about links, y'all. The format of your links. Links should be underlined in some way. On the University of Vermont website, currently links are, are underlined with a series of dots or dashes. That's still technically an underline. Your links should be a different color from non-link text. If you choose red as your link color on one page that's going to be your link color throughout the website don't choose don't switch to a different link color on a different web page do not underline any text that is not a link i know that we all got used to underlining like section headings back when word processing was was brand spanking new but it's it's 2022 or 2023 when you're watching this and you shouldn't underline text that is not a link. People come across underlined text and they expect it to perform like a link. This is a new one. Links should be three to four words, not just one. This is actually going to be part of the WCAG 2.2 guidelines, which are com coming out any day now. The reason for this guideline is if you are someone who is working with uh, reduced mobility in your hands or fingers, uh, you don't want to have to zero in on a tiny little target to click a link. So as a web developer, you're trying to be kind and you're giving people a larger area so they don't have to be as precise with their, their targeting. 
And finally, short links are friendly to screen readers. A lot of links we see nowadays have session variables or other variables are passing through in the browser. And they're those long strings of, of nonsensical text. If you use that link in your the link on your web page, a screen reader is going to read every single character in that URL. Whereas if you use a link shortener like go.uvm.edu, a link shortening service, your screen reader is only going to read the short link and the context of the short link. And you're able to provide much better context for users. You can use go.uvm.edu slash and then a word that describes the, the destination that folks are going to be taken to. Let's talk about link destinations. If you are linking to something that is not a web page, you're linking to a PowerPoint or a Microsoft Word um, document, it's going to queue up an automatic download in some people's browsers. People need to know that that's what they're signing up for when they click the link. You don't want to uh, have people start unexpected downloads from a browser. Um, that can be really confusing to people with cognitive or intellectual disabilities. It can be startling to people working with anxiety or neurodivergent um, uh, systems. You really want to, at the end of the link, just put in parentheses what the document is. If it's a PowerPoint, put dot .pptx. If it's a Word doc, dot .docx. If it's a PDF, dot .pdf. And if it's a video, just put the word video in the parentheses. So no one wants to click a link and have it all of a sudden a video start playing in another tab in their browser. Links. Do not click here. It should be clear from the link where clicking that link will tell, take you. And that means do not use click here. You can't tell anything about where you're going to wind up through the phrase click here. And if you're using a screen reader, then you're going to hear the terms click here, click here, click here over and over again. I've got a tweet embedded here from Emily Smith who works in accessibility. She says, I'm just a girl standing in front of the internet asking you for the love of goodness to stop using click here to embed your links. It's inaccessible. She has a great Twitter thread about how the, all the ways it is inaccessible. But it doesn't give you any idea where you're going to be going. So put meaningful text in your links instead. So instead of saying, to find out more about the conference, click here. You could say something like, to find out more about the conference, check out the link, schedule of programming, end link. Then people know they're going to be taken to the schedule of programming. Or you could say, to find out more about the conference, check out the registration. Direct people straight to your registration page. But people need to know where they're being directed to. And your short URLs have the ability to be meaningful and provide context. So instead of to find out more about the conference, click here. To find out more about the conference, click this link, go.uvm.edu slash schedule. You know now that you're going to a schedule. You can use click click here if you're going to give some indication of where the link is going. The destination is important. In that second example, you see it says click this link and then it gives the actual informative text of the link. Go.uvm.edu slash schedule tells you you're going to a schedule. Tip number five. Use headings to structure your content. This makes your page more accessible to both people using a keyboard to navigate and people using screen readers. When I talk about headings to structure your content, I mean, you're creating an outline, basically, of your content. Your, your top level headings, your second level headings, your third level headings. So imagine that you are putting on the 2022 Spring Conference on Wildlife Safety. You have a list of links here, and right now they are all the same weight. They're just a link, a list of links. 2022 Spring Conference, programming. Track one, badger poking. Track two, weasel wrangling. Track three, first aid. And then registration. All of those as a list don't give you any idea how the, the information relates to one another. Those three tracks are actually part of the programming. So we want to indicate that it's a conference that has programming and registration, and that part of the programming are these three different tracks. So you're going to use headings to do that. Heading one would be that you have a spring conference on wildlife safety. Heading two could be programming. And underneath your heading two for programming, you could have three heading threes for your three different tracks. 
And then a second appearance of heading two would be registration. You can see that programming and registration are now within the same weight and programming contains these three different tracks. If you're working in WordPress, in the classic editor, at least, if you uh, click on the drop down menu where it's listed as paragraph, you'll see that you're you're automatically given up to six default sets of headings to dig into. Tip number six, this is a really important one, moving, flashing and blinking objects. Don't have anything blinking at three times per second or faster. That's a WCAG guideline. And it's single A guideline, meaning that if you violate this, your website is fundamentally broken. And it is because we know that three times per second when something's blinking, that's the lowest threshold to trigger seizures in people with photosensitivity. You don't want to trigger seizures using your website. You don't want your website to injure people. If you have anything blinking at that rate or faster, you are creating a web page that has the potential to injure someone. You also don't want to set things up to autoplay. Nobody wants to be startled out of their shoes by a video or a, 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 a audio that automatically starts playing. And users should always have a, a way to make it all start and stop. This is currently a huge problem with, with the new set of ads I'm seeing everywhere that they just will keep rolling over into different ads or they have animation in the ads and there's no way to tell the animation to stop. Um, it's, it's super distracting. It's super uncomfortable. But it can also be dangerous for people who are using those websites. Don't do it. Finally, you want to write for accessibility. And that means using plain language. That's active voice, that's short sentences, and that's defining any jargon. And that includes words that are three syllables or more. You also want to give each page title a clear and distinct title. If you are a project that puts on a number of different events, you cannot have multiple pages that all are titled registration. Who knows which registration page they're going to click on that way? You want to have something that's like, you know, spring wildlife conference registration, fall wildlife conference registration, that sort of thing. So people can tell which registration page they're going to. Each page needs a clear and distinct title. And you want to provide clear and concise instructions for using your website. If you want people to register, give them clear instructions for how to register. Here's how to register for our conference. One, fill out the form below. Two, we'll get in touch with you to arrange payment. There you go. Now it's clear how to register for your event. All these uh, accessibility tips, by the way, this all nowadays goes into Google rankings. So Google rankings used to be just SEO, search engine optimization, but now Accessibility does play a part in where Google will rank your website, how easy Google will make it for people to find your website, how many people they're going to show your website to. Accessibility does count in these stakes. So it just makes no sense to spend a lot of time on your website, getting all the content perfect and beautiful, and then getting have no one see it because your accessibility isn't up to snuff. Now, here I usually go through a lot of examples showing you what not to do, and I do that using two methods. One is I I put up things I've made and let people tear them apart, or I get consent from people who've made uh, certain things and, and they're happy to have feedback on their designs as well. We did this for the accessible graphic design um, workshop. But here, I think it's most useful for you to just go and look at one example, and that's Ravelry.com. So I've linked here to an accessibility case study for Ravelry. But in a nutshell, Ravelry.com put out a website where the old design had some accessibility issues. And when it came time to update the design, they didn't really consult anyone around accessibility. They didn't use an accessibility consultant. And so their new design was actually even more inaccessible. And it did contain, it does contain, because it is still in existence, it does contain elements that are triggering migraines and seizures and headaches in users. And then they had an issue with a customer service representative who wasn't responding appropriately to these complaints people were bringing up. And after that, as 
the clamor grew, Ravelry just closed responses to these complaints on their social media channels. Their social media channels aren't accepting any type of conversation around this. They're not responding. If people tell you your website is injuring them, you have to do something. So take a moment to read through the accessibility case study of Ravelry. It's very interesting and illuminating in, in how not to respond to, to users who bring you problems with your website. Because again, accessible, making an accessible web is everyone's job, not just when you, if you're creating websites for work, or you're creating websites for UVM, you're creating websites for um, the Rotary Club, but also think about this. If you're leaving a comment for someone on Reddit, now you know you could, if you want to link to uh, a new resource, you can create a three to four word link and you're doing your part to make it a little bit more accessible. If you're going to link to a video resource in that comment, put the word video in parentheses after your link and you're doing, you're making bit by bit, you're making the web a little bit more accessible. Finally, accessibility is a process. It's not a destination. I mean, you, you'll do everything in your power to make something accessible and then the technology will change. Browsers will update. New information will get added and you have to do it all over again. So you really want to be doing a, a website audit on a regular basis. But here are three recommendations. One, just try your best. Anything you're doing to make the web more accessible is awesome. Two, ask for help. Ask for help from people who know accessibility. There's a ton of groups. Hire a consultant. Use an online accessibility tool as well as doing your own manual accessibility checks. And three, most importantly, incorporate user feedback from people with disabilities who are going to tell you their lived experience of using your website. Because those WCAG guidelines are the basic lower threshold for making an accessible website. But you also want to make an inclusive and welcoming website that everyone talks about and shares and directs their friends to. And the best way to do that is to incorporate user feedback from people with disabilities. Finally, realize two things. One, no one should have to disclose their disability status to you in order to access your website effectively. I run into this a lot with people who are saying, well, we're, we don't need to do we don't need to do this accessibility thing because we gave a survey to our users and no one said they were using a screen reader. No one should have to tell you that they use a screen reader. No one should have to tell you that they need captions. No one should have to disclose their disability status to you. You want to do these things proactively. And two, use human data to supplement your general guidelines. If you're updating a department website, don't be shy about sending that website around for feedback to the department. Say, let people know what's changed. Ask them what they think. Ask them to, to use it. If nothing else, you're letting people know that your website's fresh and, and newly updated. And, and it's, it's awesome. And it's worth visiting. And it's bumping up your metrics a little bit. Anyway, thank you for your time. Uh, we are releasing this presentation under Creative Commons 4.0 by NCSA. What that means is we ask that you give us attribution, that you only remix and reuse this presentation non-commercially, and that you use share alike copyright standards, which is you may not copyright it for your own self. If you're going to give us attribution, please credit the Center on Disability and Community Inclusion at the University of Vermont. Thank you.